So welcome everybody. Um, my name is Dan Fagan. I'm the director of the Science, Health, and Environmental Reporting Program here at NYU. Uh, I see a lot of faces I don't know, which is wonderful. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, I'm also a professor here, and the SHRP program, for those of you who don't know, has been uh, granting a master's in journalism and a certificate in science journalism for the last 30 years. The 29th and 30th classes are here now, and uh, I see some alumni too, so it's, it's great. Uh, we have these Inside Out events uh, four times a year, uh, four times a semester. And we have one more scheduled for the week after Thanksgiving uh, when uh, Maya Salovitz will be here. Uh, she's a very interesting blogger and writer on neuroscience issues. But today, our guest is Margaret Wartime, and I will let uh, Lee formally introduce her. But for now, I'll just say thank you very much, Margaret, for coming. And with that, uh, I will turn the mic over to Lee Holtz, science columnist for the Wall Street Journal and a distinguished writer in residence here at the Carter Institute of Journalism at NYU. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dan. So welcome to Inside Out. I hope you're all comfortable. I hope you've had a chance to get a glass of wine or take advantage of the uh, groaning board over there. We're here this evening to talk about uh, science writing, to talk about uh, science communication. And we attempt this um, by way of a conversation with uh, someone who is, uh, by the judgment of our peers, um, a leading practitioner of the craft. And we've been very fortunate over the years to be uh, able to avail ourselves of uh, so many uh, of the best uh, science writers working um, today, and we are certainly uh, very much uh, uh, blessed that way this evening. Now, the idea here is that this is a conversation. Um, despite my tendencies to monologue, I urge you to interrupt. I urge you to help us digress. Uh, we're going to set the topic. We're going to explore um, a particular work, and it's a jumping off point. It's a, a trampoline for a broader discussion and hopefully uh, creative digressions about what we do. As Dan said, this is the third in our series. And what we've been doing this fall and what, we will be do, uh, what we'll do this evening is we're going to be talking about point of view. We're going to be talking about story choice. We're going to be talking about how to unharness imagination uh, in the service of uh, science writing. In particular, we want to look at and talk about some non-traditional and very innovative ways in which we can engage readers who, left to their own devices, could care less about the news uh, of science. Readers, I should say, viewers, listeners, um, who should listen to us if we can find a way to speak a language they can hear and if we can find how to listen to them. Uh, we are this evening uh, joined by Margaret uh, Wertheim, who surely is one of the most original minds uh, at work in science writing uh, today, in science communication. Uh, she is, as Nature magazine recently headlined, uh, the outsider insider. Um, she is originally from Brisbane, Australia. She's a science writer, she's a commentator, she's a book reviewer. She's written extensively for uh, uh, the New York Times, The Sciences, New Scientist, Times Literary Supplement, The Guardian. She was for uh, many years a columnist for LA Weekly where she wrote a column kind of meditating on physics and culture called Quark Soup. Um, she was uh, the writer and host of a PBS documentary about science and religion called Faith and Reason. She's been a research associate at the American Museum of Natural History and uh, a fellow with the Los Angeles Institute for the Humanities. And her work has been much admired. She was awarded the Print Journalism Prize from the American Institute for Biological Sciences. And um, she was included in Best American uh, Science Writing uh, by no less uh, a tastemaker than Oliver Sacks. Um, and as a, as a, uh, a hint of, of her uh, broad approach to the task of uh, science writing, I will mention now that uh, in 2003 with her sister, uh, Christine, um, she founded uh, in Los Angeles uh, an organization called the Institute uh, for Figuring, 
which is devoted to promoting public, and, uh, pu public understanding of the poetic and aesthetic dimensions of uh, science and mathematics. And it really is an alternative form of storytelling, which we'll get into a little bit later. Primarily for our purposes tonight, uh, Margaret is the author of three books um, that have collectively explored the role of theoretical physics in the cultural landscape of our society. The first one was called Pythagoras Trousers, and it was a history of the relationship between physics and gender and religion, and it, if I may try to do it in a, in a thumbnail, it, it really tried to argue that physics is itself a form of religious devotional activity, a kind of divine pursuit, and that this um, intermingling of science and religion uh, is a, a major reason why women have had to fight so hard for so long to find their proper place in the scientific world. And then the second, which I'm happy to have here, is called the Pearly Gates of Cyberspace. And again, working the same territory, this looks at the history of scientific thinking about our ideas of space itself, working from a cultural standpoint with the frescoes of Giotto and uh, the metaphysical constructs of uh, Dante, to modern ideas of the internet with its kind of uh, idolatry of cyberspace and its uh, dreams of machine consciousness as a kind of uh, uh, new messiah. Um, this evening, we are going to focus specifically on her new book, Physics on the Fringe. And um, it's really hard to sort of know where to start with this book because <laughs> it's, it is really so original. Um, it is a... Uh, a story really, if, if I may put it to you, that in a, in a very real way kind of began in what would normally be my wastebasket. This is uh, every science writer uh, eventually starts getting crank letters, uh, crank calls uh, uh, from people who believe they have solved the, the, the mysteries of general relativity or uh, uh, have found the key to gravity. And, if only you could get the world to listen, everything would be great. And the natural instinct of uh, any sensible uh, journalist is to sort of chuck that straight in the circular file, that the proper archive for such work is the wastebasket. But Margaret, you really brought a, a kind of a different sensibility to this. And I wonder if you'd just explain to us sort of the, the beginnings of this story and how you approached it. Mm. I mean, you're a collector, really, in a strange way, of these people. Yes, over the past um, 15 or so years, I've developed um, a a, an unintended, in some ways, collection of these people's ideas. And I haven't really gone out of my way to collect them. Somehow they found their way to my door through being a science writer. You know, in the weirdest channels, they've come to me. And rather than putting them into the waste file, I've kept them all. And at first when I started doing this, I just thought it was, as it were, it was going to be a kind of esoteric habit, hobby. And I didn't really know what I would do with them. And then I met one particular extraordinary example of it, a guy called Jim Carter, who's became the hero of my book. And Jim's a remarkable version of it. And I should actually say he's the first one I ever met in person. And I'm extremely glad that he was, because he's a very unusual case of it. And his, it was him personally that convinced me that I should write something about this. That at first I thought I'd just write an article for, you know, for Science Magazine. But I became increasingly intrigued with him as a person. And he, he's unusual in that he has a complete alternative theory of the universe. He has a theory of gravity, he has an alternative theory of the periodic table, which one of his images is up here. Um, he has a complete account, alternative account of the creation of the universe. So he, he believes he's got a final theory of everything. And he does all these extraordinary um, illustrations and animations of his ideas, some of which we'll, we'll show. And he has this remarkable life. And I really became intrigued with the question, what drives a man with no science training? He has no science training. He lives in a trailer park outside of Seattle. What, and I became completely fascinated with the question, what drives a man with no science training to think he can succeed where Einstein and Stephen Hawking have failed? And for me, I was intrigued by that in question in two senses. One is, what drives him personally? 
like what makes Jim Carter Jim Carter and what makes him do this. But I also became fascinated with a broader question. What are the social forces that are act and our society's relationship to science that are making him and other, other outsider physicists want to do this at all? I mean, why in the age of you know, hugely expensive Nova series about string theory, when you can go and buy all kinds of books by people like Brian Greene and Lisa Randall and Stephen Hawking, and all of these books coming out all the time and TV series, why would anybody feel they had to reinvent physics from the ground up for themselves? And so I really wanted to understand the broader picture here. What did this say about our society's relationship to theoretical physics as a whole? Well, I'm curious now what it says, though, about the relationship of you as of a me. writer. <laughs> yes. It and is. now you are by training a physicist, yes? I, I went to university for six years and studied physics and mathematics and I thought I would go on to be a professional physicist. But I decided after six years um, in a university um, academic science setting that uh, I actually wanted to sort of be in a broader social context myself. So I basically my whole professional life has been as a science communicator. So what, I'm, I'm, I'm still back on, on as, a, as a writer now, mm. as a science writer, you're mm. there, you have bills to pay, you're uh, trying to think of, <laughs> you know, your next column, yeah. or how can I turn yeah. this into mm. something for Wired Magazine or Discover yes. or for the LA yeah. Weekly. And I mean, what was your initial point of contact with this particular, um, I, don't wanna, I don't wanna call him a crank, because that really doesn't do him justice, I don't want to call him a pseudo-scientist either because <laughs> I'm not making a value judgment, but mm. with this genuinely deluded <laughs> um, uh, person who, who is, I think you lose a wonderful phrase, you say, bamboozled by ideas. Um, mm. How did you literally make acquaintance? What was your first oh, point of contact? Oh, literally, yeah. how did I yeah, meet yeah, you? Yeah. Oh, well, that's actually... I mean, you can never find yeah. a crank when you're looking for one. I mean, it's so... <laughs> No, and, and I mean, well, I'll tell you the story because yeah, it, 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 it's completely unlikely and completely, it shows you how um, unexpected, well, how little tiny things in your life can take you in completely unexpected directions. This is, this is like the butterfly wings, you know, mm -hmm. the Lorenz effect, that, you know, the butterfly flapping its wings in China can affect, you know, tsunamis in Africa. This is what happened to me. When I was writing my first book, Pythagoras' Trousers, which is a history of the relationship between physics and religion, I was buying, I was reading a, a lot about the history of science. I sort of feel like I gave myself a master's degree in the history of science. And I was buying a lot of secondhand academic books from a very good book dealer in LA. And one day I was in there picking up something and she said, Oh, Margaret, this package came in the mail the other day. I was about to throw it into the bin when I thought of you. And she handed me this package, and in it was this letter from this guy called Jim. This was at the end of 1993. Okay. It was a letter from this guy, Jim Carter, saying, announcing the imminent publication of his, of his self-published book, The Other Theory of Physics. And included in this package not, was not just the announcement of the book, but a copy of this wall chart showing his hmm. alternative explanation of the, new, of the periodic table. This is his alternative account of nuclear physics. And on the back of it, this chart was the, his alternative account of the creation of the universe. And I thought, oh, this guy's, you know, this is beautiful. I thought, this is intriguing. But the thing that really convinced me that I should follow up on this guy is there was a little yellow order form included in the package. And option number one on the order form was basically, here's a check for a copy of you know, the other theory of physics. Option number two was, I'm very short of cash, but at this point in time, sorry, at this point in time, I'm very short of cash, but the enclosed letter endorsing your theory entitles <laughs> me to a free copy. Huh. And option number three was, your gravity theory sucks. <laughs> so I took option number two and I huh. wrote him a letter uh -huh. endorsing his theory as uh -huh. I dimly understood it at the time. Uh -huh. And he sent me back a pre-press version of his book. And I mean, what that shows you is the man has a sense of humour. Now, this is a very rare quality in outsider physicists. I'm supremely grateful that the Winds of Fortune sent me Jim Carter and not a million of these other ones, because I actually have never met another one that I could have written a book about. I mean, I, over the last 18 years, I've spent a lot of time with Jim. I've got to know his family, I've got to know his life. And it's been 
a totally rewarding experience. He's unlike any other person I've ever met. He's inspired me to do things I never thought that I could have done. And in some ways, you can say he's a monomaniac because he does think he's the new Newton. He's not just the new Einstein. In his mind, he's the new Newton. But that said, he is truly just about the most inspiring person I've ever met. And I've met a lot of Nobel Prize winners. I've met scientists who are doing extraordinary things in the Antarctic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Jim is an amazing human being. He lives life more fully on his own terms than anyone I've ever met. He and I became really fascinated with what drove him because he, he's building secret caves, he's building his own house which has got grass on the roof and a tree growing through the middle of it. it looks like some sort of Middle Earth fantasy. And he's, having, he's building his own cosmos. And I became really fascinated. How does a person have not just the chutzpah, but the courage to do this. We live in a society where we're so used to getting experts to do things for, for us. You know, something breaks, you get an expert. Jim's philosophy is you want something done, you do it yourself. And if you don't know how to do it, you teach yourself. You don't ask for an expert, you don't wait for a grant, you don't wait for permission, you just do it. Whether it's building a car, building your house, digging a secret cave, constructing a theory of the cosmos, publishing the book, designing the book, designing the computer animations. I mean, all of it he does himself. Right, and, and I, feel, and I feel obliged <laughs> to sort of say as a matter of baseline here, because it's quite clear you have yes. really very enthralled with this <laughs> guy and his, his character. But this, this is a man who runs a trailer park. I mean, that he's a, he's a, a, a guy who, who thinks yes. with his hands. I mean, this yes. is not... Uh, yes. Somebody. Uh, I mean, there is a whole tradition of, of uh, weird physics. I mean, of, of mm. physicists who are kind of outside the mainstream, but mm. they are part of the broader orthodoxy. I mean, mm. they're card-carrying, credentialed, PhD, mm. quantum mechanics of a yeah. sort. This is not what we're talking about here. Nor are we talking about a story that you were actually looking for. So this is the other thing I'm wondering about that you were yeah. not out there at this stage thinking, you know, I would love to write, uh, uh, John McPhee recently had an essay in The New Yorker where he mm -hmm. talked about um, how he structures stories and, mm -hmm. and he makes it clear that he constructs a full formula, I mean like A, oh, B, really? C, D <laughs> over Q, you know, um, <laughs> of a story in advance and then goes to find something that will fit this kind really? of creative tension that he's already mapped out, yeah. And, uh, you know, if you're John McPhee, I guess you can make this work. But I don't think that's what you had in mind. You were mm. sitting there buying books for something else, and this, mm. this leaf, this for you had your Forrest Gump moment. Um, <laughs> what, what made you want to take that casual encounter mm. and blow it into this? I mean... Mm. This is a substantial investment of your intellectual capacity, of your life, of your patience. I mean, you spent 15 years, I think. On, yes. On, off on, and on. Yes. Kind of, help me understand that better. Well. That's not an impulse. No. What um, is it? Well, I, I have to say, it's a very, it's a very perceptive <laughs> question. <laughs> um, and I, I mean, I can, I can, I'll have to sort of, as it were, sidle up to the full answer, because it, it's sort of, it's still something I'm struggling with in my own head in some ways. I didn't intend for this project to, as it were, take over my life in the way that it did. Um, I don't think I've ever sort of been pos felt possessed like a sub by a subject in the way that this subject came to literally possess me. H have any of you ever read a book called um, Ridley Walker? Now oh, it's an amazing, English science fiction book, uh, post-apocalyptic book by a, an English writer called Russell Hoban. It's one of the most astounding pieces of science fiction ever written. People either love it or hate it. It's a bit like Clockwork Orange. It's written mm. in this sort of broken down version of English. And I once read an interview with Russell Hoban about this book and he said, look, it was like no other thing that I've ever done. It, it just sort of, this thing took a hold of me and it just wouldn't let me go, and it was sort of shaking me, and it wouldn't let me go until it came out the way that it wanted to be. And at the time I thought, oh, that's really intriguing, that's an interesting experience to have as a writer. And I felt, felt like this is what happened to me with this subject. It possessed me. Um, 
I, I've spent more time on this project than I've ever spent on anything. It's been, financially speaking, absolute insanity. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's no way that, that I can justify the time that I've spent on this in any economic terms. Um, a lot of my friends thought I'd gone off the rails taking on this subject. I mean, seriously, a lot of, a lot of my science journalistic friends and, and a lot of my friends who were scientists, when I told them that I was working on this book, really said some version of, why are you, Margaret, a serious science writer, wasting your time on these cranks? You know, they re I really felt very little support uh, from my peers for doing this project. Can I follow um, up on that, Margaret? Yeah. Please. It, it, it's really interesting that uh, I'm, I'm over here. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Sorry yeah, about the lights. Big bright light. Hello. It's really interesting to me that in describing all the things about this guy that you found interesting and, and compelling, you never once said, you know, and he was right. <laughs> uh, in fact, that seems ir ir almost irrelevant. And that's fascinating to me and I, I think it, it is part of the skepticism that your idea uh, was greeted with by your friends in the science journalism community. You know, journalism is often described as, as the, a discipline of verification, that we're all about verification and science journalism especially. <laughs> science is a, a process of coming and developing increasingly accurate explanations of the, of the natural world. But that's not what you're doing here at all, right? Or, or am I wrong? And wh where does, does truth have anything to do with this? And, and how, did, how, did you, ah. how did you deal with it? But now, you know, Dan, I have to say, you just at the very last second sort of threw in a red herring there. Yeah. Which is, Let's not say truth. No, no. I think, I think <laughs> actually this book is more about the truth of science than about the facts of science. Um, that the point of it is that he's wrong. I mean, that that's the funhouse mirror through mm -hmm. which we see distorted, but more clearly, the structure and principles and prejudices and operations of conventional science, but that's my answer, not yours. Well, the, the issue that you're raising, Dan, is that it is pretty a version of the question that everybody, almost everybody, who, uh, when I tell them about this book or they hear about it, every, almost everybody has some version of the question, but is, is he the next Einstein? Is he right? Is his theory ever going to be validated? And the thing is, it raises questions, well, what would it mean for it to be validated? What, what, do, you, what do you mean by that? What do, what do you think it means for a thing to be true? And I'll put it this way, I don't think that Jim Carter or any of the outsiders that I've ever met um, are ever going to be taught in Harvard or Princeton departments of physics. I don't think that they should be. I don't think that any of them are going to win the Nobel Prize. So in that sense, um, Jim is not the next Einstein. But he, he has created an extraordinary description of the universe that satisfies him. And I think that this raises a question about one of the fundamental roles of science, and particularly theoretical physics for us as human beings, is the following. We often are used to thinking about science, particularly physics, as being something that gives us instrumental successes. You know, we get microchips, so we get these wonderful Macintoshes, we've got lasers, we've got telecommunications. And all of this happens because of the discoveries that physicists made that are ultimately put into practice by engineers. And we all celebrate that and that's magnificent. But theoretical physics actually serves another purpose too, and this is what my book is really about. It, it serves, ever since um, science supplanted religion as the official way of describing reality, physics is the discipline through which we've tried to say this is what our cosmological framework is, this is what reality is, this is where we as humans fit into this wider cosmological scheme. You know, 
and in recent years, one way scientists have talked about this is to say that science is this way that makes us feel at home in the universe, as Stuart Kaufman's famous phrase puts it, and as people like Richard Dawkins have echoed, science allows us to see the beauty and the wonder of our cosmic home. Isn't that fabulous? And for those of us who are trained in science, it is fabulous. But Jim and the other outsider physicists that I chart in my book, they say, we look at the theories that you physicists have created, like general relativity and quantum theory and string theory, and we think it's bamboozling rubbish. We don't understand it. We don't feel at home in the universe that is described this way. And so what they're saying is that science is failing to fulfill what is apparently openly stated as one of its functions, to make us feel at home in the world. And we don't feel at home in the world that you guys are describing. And we do believe that science can make us feel at home in the world. And we actually believe that we can have a dialogue with nature and come to an understanding of our cosmic home that the ordinary hu in the language that the ordinary human being can comprehend. But a part of what I think, mm. Dan, that you're getting at mm. is that often, I don't want to say normally, but often a, the role of a science journalist or an environmental journalist or a public health writer would be to to sort of have the thesis, you know, the water is poisoned or the this or... Right. Um, and, and the job here is to assemble the evidence to prove that it's right. I mm. do not see here that you see your, your, your goal here is to be Carter's advocate to sort of mm. be, the, be the person at the end of the phone who finally lets the rest of the world yeah. know about his theory of circlons and smoke rings and, yes. and, and, and they will see that he's right. You don't think he's right. Yes. No, I mean... I mean, that's not the it, point, right? It's very I, mean, you, you, I have to ask you this, so far on the record, you don't believe this. I, I don't believe that this is going to win a Nobel Prize, right. and I don't believe that it's, it can or should be taught in you know, Harvard Physics Department. Um, I believe in it in the following sense, mm -hmm. that I think part of the role of science is, and particularly of theoretical physics, is, to put it really bluntly, is to be a form of fabulous entertainment. And how many of you are watching Brian Greene's program mm. on string theory that's on, you know, at the moment? Yeah, right, right. No. Yeah, it, it's, yeah. it is entertainment. It's fabulously entertaining. Mm -hmm. There's no empirical evidence for any of it. But we Absolutely. enjoy it. That's true. Those That's of us true. who love science mm -hmm. enjoy this. I'm a subscriber to New Scientist, and one of the things I love about New Scientist is I think it's an absolutely amazing, the excellent science magazine. But one of the things that's amazing about it is that every week you get a radical new theory of the universe. Every week. You know, it's fifth, it's five dimensions, there's negative gravity, there's negative energy, there's this, that, and the other thing. I mean, every week we've got an astounding fantastic speculative ideas coming out from the physics mainstream. They can't all be right. They can't possibly, because there's another one every week. And I enjoy this. I really enjoy it. And I was realising at one point, I'm just enjoying this as pure fiction. I find this thrilling form of, of, of fantasy. And I realise this is actually one of the roles of contemporary theoretical <coughs> physics, is just to be an enjoyable form of entertainment in a very stimulating intellectual way. I think Jim's a fabulous form of intellectual entertainment. Do I, do I think it's true? No. But did I enjoy it? Did I have a thrilling time? Yeah. Yes, yeah. I did. It's a bit like watching Avatar. Yeah. You know? No, yes, yes. It, it and I feel like obliged again to point out that you, your book does mm. not attempt to argue that it is true, that yeah. your book places this in a, in a much broader um, mm. context. I think, I, to accept, yeah, I think at one point you note that they're actually uh, although you, you like Jim's the best, that there are at least 120 mm. different, uh, I don't want to call them cranks, I'll say fringe theories um, uh, that are acknowledged out there in, in, this, uh, in this world of outsider physics, and that there are probably far more, but yeah. certainly not as many as, as there are in accepted, conventional, academically blessed uh, string cosmology, where there, I forget yeah. the number, 10 to the 500. 10, 10 to the 500 is 10 the, to the 500 current estimate. Unproven of, theories. So, yeah. But now, as a craftsperson, so there you are back, uh, you've received this, uh, this uh, 
little butterfly flap of the wing in the form of this message in the bookstore. Um, how did you then sort of literally proceed? I mean, did you go straight to uh, Mr. Carter, call him up, and you say, you know what, I'm just really fascinated by the absurdity and the entertaining quality of the ideas that you present, and I want to put all of that in front of the world, many of whom will scoff and laugh. Mm. Um, I mean, how did you work this person as a source? What did you, how well, did you, what, what was the compact that you entered mm. into with him? Well, that, that's a good question, Lee, because I, I, I didn't really, as it were, go about it with a set of um, presupposed anythings because I, I first encountered Jim's chart in 1993 and it was about a year later that I just happened to be invited to give a talk um, at Pacific Lutheran University, which actually was the college where Jim and went to school for one term. And um, so I, I thought, well, after the talk, I'd drive out and meet him. And um, I really didn't know what to expect. And I thought I saw a little bit of his universe. Uh, you know, I saw that he not only had a theory of the universe, but that he, was, he had this bizarre house that he had built, and he had a pet swan that followed him around like a dog. But he also had, you know, two actual dogs and two actual sons and a, and a wife, an absolutely fantastic wife, and he clearly had a fantastic family life. And um, he was digging secret caves, and, and I thought, you know, this is really intriguing. And I really didn't know what I would do with him, and, but I thought he was worth getting to know. So I, I sort of just kept going back to see him every now and again. And um, my then husband and I decided that we thought what he was doing was fantastic, and at that point he was beginning to do um, his experiments with smoke rings to test his ideas about subatomic particles. And so we thought we'd film this. So instead and, of and building a collider, he's, he's blowing smoke rings. Yeah, he be, I mean, I can show you some pictures. And then, you know, he believes that all particles, all subatomic <coughs> particles are made, uh, are the, all matter is made up of these ring-shaped particles that he calls circlons. And that these circlons link together to form atomic structures. Um, and just let me. I can see that you were really well, partly seduced by the visuals here. Yes. And one form, I mean, I, one form of these ring shaped particles that occurs physically is smoke rings. And you can actually do experiments with smoke rings. Um, and show how the smoke rings interact with one another. Jim was beginning to work out how to make giant smoke rings. Now, one of the things that's, so my husband and I, we decided to film this, and we ultimately ended up making a sort of very much DIY documentary about him, and I'll show you some of the smoke rings at the end of it and some of his animations, it's just beautiful. But one of the things that's absolutely amazing about this is you're probably all sitting there thinking, oh, this is mad. but. The, this illustration of smoke rings going through smoke rings, which is something you can make happen if you're really <coughs> careful with the technique of it, this was not come from Jim Carter. This comes from James Clark Maxwell. Hmm. And Maxwell and his colleagues, um, t William Thompson, who was Lord Kelvin, who is, you know, invented the Kelvin degrees, the absolute temperature scale, and discovered absolute zero, he and his colleague, Peter Guthrie Tate was one of the great mathematicians of the 19th century. But between the three of them, in the 1870s, they spent about a decade doing experiments with smoke rings because they, Kelvin had the idea that smoke rings could actually give, explain the, the structure of matter. And this was based on flu, new discoveries in fluid dynamics, and particularly the ability to analyze the Navier-Stokes equations. And so, Tate and Thompson and Maxwell became convinced that this could actually be a, a theory of, of subatomic structure. So what your, your so fringe scientist is doing is actually hearkening back to earlier gropings of, of who we yes. would consider credentialed great figures in the yes. history of science, trying to groping mm. for some reality, things that they discarded mm. on their journey. But Jim didn't know any of this. Yeah. He wasn't aware of any of this. Uh -huh. And I only found it out after, I found it out fairly soon after he started going to do smoke rings, but I didn't tell him. Ah, I mean, I, I just 
I wanted him to do what he was doing. But I became fascinated. Okay, so this, as it were, lunatic in a trailer park's doing this, but here's James Clark. That illustration was created by Maxwell. And the, Who is not a lunatic in a trailer park. And trailer. See, here's an illustration yeah. from Tate. This, this illustration comes from 1867. In, Tate and Thompson wrote um, a book um, that was the standard textbook for physics students for about two generations in the late 19th century. And this illustration comes, this is an illustration of their smoke ring generating machine. Hmm. Hmm. Let me, and so, we, I'm sorry, I want to, because oh, yeah. I know we have a question out here. It's been yeah. very patient. Where are we? Oh. Yeah. I have a microphone. Oh. When I said interrupt, I meant it. Yeah, I thought we had one interrupt, but I, I think what's really missing this time, but um, I'm wondering if you said you don't believe it, but you believe in it. Um, if, if you ever let yourself sort of just kind of a state and just imagine you believe it, and like, if you, not that you try to believe it, because you just can't afford to help believe something, but if you just ever kind of let go and thought, what if I did believe this all the time? If you flirted with that at all, and if you really don't believe it right. So I'm not sure what the question is. Um, did, you, did you ever sort of come close to believing it? <laughs> Yeah. Did you suspend your disbelief? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Drink the Kool-Aid. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Kool Kool right. Right. Well, I mean, did you have to do that in order to write his? You know, I never, I never had to do that, or even tell myself I ought to do that, while I was writing the book. But that said, I really did have to struggle with the question of, given that I don't believe that this is the final theory of anything. Um, why, but I, I clearly am enchanted by it, I clearly am fascinated by it, why? What's the source of my enchantment and my um, delight in this? I do take enormous delight in seeing Jim's work, I think it's really beautiful and I'll show you some more pictures. Um, this by the way is a zoetrope that Maxwell made to, to animate this three smoking encounter. And Jim also makes animations of his theories. This, by the way, is, you can blow circular bubbles underwater. That's a diver blowing circular bubbles. Um, but so I, I became really enchanted, at, and, and, it, and I struggled for a long time to try to articulate to myself, why am I so enchanted? Why am I so fascinated? And it wasn't an easy task. I mean, as I said, this book is the longest and hardest project of my life, and it wasn't easy to think through what is it that I can really say here? Because, because clearly, as a science journalist, your, your job is supposed to be to illuminate the truth. But that wasn't, it was clearly not what I was doing. And I have to say, I had a remarkably wonderful editor in this book, and she's here, Jackie Johnson from Walker. And, and Jackie really helped me to kind of articulate. She was very sensitive to this process and it took a long time. I think Jackie will testify that I think there's probably times when everybody at the editorial, t at my, at the publisher kind of began to wonder if I was ever going to finish. I began to wonder if I was ever going to finish because I didn't really know how to answer that question. And in the end, I, I don't really answer the question, but what I've tried to convey in the book is that I think the line between what's true and not true is not clear. There isn't a clear burning line in the sand that we can tell. And I think that's one of the things that those of us who love science need to, as it were, accept that it isn't a clear hard line. And that's my problem with someone like Richard Dawkins, who I know and like and respect. But it's like Richard always wants to say that it's, it's totally clear, this is good, proper science, and that's rubbish. But there are so many areas of science where it's not clear what's rubbish and what's not. And different people have different views, and some of them will be borne out and some of them won't. And how do we at any point in time negotiate that question? And I think those of us 
who convey science to the public. I think part of our mission ought to be to be more nuanced about what science is and not present this as it were, I think, false, clear, hard conception of what it is. So who are you writing Wait. for here? Oh, no, please. Oh, that's okay. This is what yeah, just uh, get the microphone down. Yeah. Just take the mic. Thanks. Yeah, just on what you just said, I mean, you were talking earlier about these fundamental theories, you know, is he the next Einstein or whatnot? There was a blog post or an article, something I read recently in the last two days, talking about psychology and how it had no fundamental theory. Do you think that physics and chemistry, where we have these very, very well proven theories, we have relativity, we have quantum mechanics, do you think that that, in the cultural sense of those sciences, is is helping the kind of Dawkins mentality in that it's giving a very good example of something so definitely good science that, mm. that people want to draw that line, that people want more of that when we necessarily shouldn't necessarily expect that all the time? Yes, it's, it's a very good point you're making and I think it's true. I think that physics is in some sense the easy science and, and physicists will tell you this too because physics is about things that are standardized, like protons or electrons, um, they're all the same, you know, with a little bit of variation in magnetic fields or whatever, but basically a proton <coughs> is a proton. So you can have a standardized theory of a proton. You can have a standardized theory of electromagnetic waves. And I think part of the problem is that we are, some people are thinking that this has to be our conception of all sciences, that everything has to fit into this, as it were, this has to be fitable into standardized formula, like a human being has to be fitted into standardized formulas. But we are not protons. We are fundamentally different objects. And I do actually think it's a big problem at the moment that there's, there's a lot of desire out there in, in the sciences on some people's part, to have, as it were, physics-like theories, whether it's economics, whether it's sociology, whether it's psychology. And I actually think it's problematic. And this, this very problem was at the heart of the scientific revolution. In, in the 17th century, this question of what science could achieve was discussed ad infinitum by all of them. Galileo, Descartes, Newton, Kepler, they all were very, very concerned with the question, what, it, what is it that science can describe? And Descartes was the one who basically said what, is, what became the accepted answer for a long time, which is that what science can describe, particularly mathematical science, which is what he was interested in, is it can describe matter in motion through space and time. And that's what physics is. But what Descartes also said was there is this other realm of being. He called that one the res extensa, the, the extended realm of matter in motion. And he said there's this other realm of being, of reality, which is the res cogitans, the, the realm of human thoughts, feelings, emotions, and moral action. And that is outside the realm of science. And that was this sort of bipartite view of reality was accepted for a long time and people thought, okay, we just do this and we leave that alone. But now what's happening in the scientific world is people are say, saying science can do everything. It can describe the res cogitans as well as the res extensa. And I'm not convinced myself that that's true. I think I'm with, I personally believe, am with Descartes on this, that actually we, I, I think there are things that science can illuminate about human psychology, et cetera, but I do not believe that we can expect to have a totalizing theory of these things the way we can in physics. Excuse me. Yeah, please. Uh, it seems to me that uh, <coughs> actually the answer to your uh, mis mystery as to why you're fascinated by his work is surely that it's internally consistent. It may not match standard theory, and that's why you say you don't believe it, maybe, but uh, it does match itself with a high degree of internal consistency and a very fertile development of his ideas. Isn't that why you're fascinated? Because there's something beautiful about a great complex structure mm. with all these pretty patterns and so forth. But when you're faced with a science, science writers, uh, don't you have to answer the same question that all uh, physicists ask? which is uh, 
This theory may or may not be true. Let's see if it's true by seeing if it can predict anything. Can his theory, has it ever predicted anything which standard theory predicts uh, in some way which suggests that it has at least partial truth because it can predict? Well, this is an interesting question because Jim has two experiments that if ah, they yeah. were done, yeah. they would distinguish between um, his theories and the standard theory. So one is that his theory makes a prediction um, about a certain point in the periodic table where his theory would differ from the standard model. That would require some experiments in particle accelerators. His chances of getting his experiment done on CERN are zero. Same thing, he also has an experiment that would distinguish between his theory of gravity and the Einsteinian theory of gravity, but again, it would, it would have, we have to take stuff up in the space shuttle, and it's very, very competitive to get experiments done on space shuttles, so we can, he's not going to get that happening either. That said, one can look at Jim's theories, and there are all sorts of um, questions raised by his theories that are empirically testable, or could be em empirically the, what we see around us to a standard physicist is at odds with Jim's theory. And I've gently tried to probe Jim on those matters. And he would, he would either sort of, with very cleverly often, defend his theories that at times he would get a little bit flustered. And I just realised it wasn't my job. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, my goal is not to try to annihilate his theory. I'm interested in the fact that he's got theory and what drives him. I'm not interested in sort of pushing him, which comes back to your question earlier, Lee. As a journalist, what was the sort of set of presuppositions that I went into this mm -hmm, with? Because, mm -hmm. you know, there is supposed to be journalistic ethics about engaging with, a su with your subject. I mean, I, I became quite deeply involved with Jim's life in the sense that it was partly in response to us making this film that he put so much energy into making the smoke rings. I mean, I think that in, in that sense, I wasn't just an objective observer. I became, as it were, a positive thing in his life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so in the end, you know, that actually changed when I, I actually did start writing the book. That changed the way that I wrote it. I had first tried to write the book in a completely detached, I'm just being a journalistic observer sense. And as Jackie will testify, <laughs> this book went through three full drafts, which were, were all quite different. Hmm. And, and it, was, it, it took me a long time to settle on, hey, I'm not, an, I'm not a detached observer. I'm in this story, and the only way it mm -hmm. makes sense mm -hmm. to write this mm -hmm. is to let myself So, So who, who, who is your reader? Who is your reader? We've yeah. talked about this so far as this, this interesting... Um, intellectual or emotional uh, mm. journey for you, and uh, uh, I admire you for having the fortitude and the and the mm. sense of wonder to kind of go along. But mm. but who is who is it that you're trying to take with you, and why? Yes, and you know that of course is is the question that one's publisher <laughs> asks one. Yeah, I, I should perhaps quite, ask your quite editor that question. Fully, but, quite but we'll let her maintain a tactful silence. <laughs> and, uh, um, well, Jackie, would you like to say anything, or should no, no, I no, attempt no, no. to answer what? the question? I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I just, uh, but, but what? Well, you know, that's, it's a hard question, this one, Lee, because I, um, I, I had to go, I believe that the majority of the audience for this book will probably be people who are not the usual science book buying public. Because who are not who the are usual. Not. Be because I, I think that most of the, the, the people who buy science books are wanting truth. They're wanting to engage with the truth. And because that's not necessarily what this book is about. Um, I, I think that, I hope that the readership will be a very broad one. People who are interested in the DIY ethos, which is a big part of our time, so I think that probably a lot of people in the arts and humanities will be inspired by this because the whole culture of the tinkerer, the amateur, is very current at the moment in the arts and humanities. 
doing it for yourself is a very big thing in the arts now. And so I think that, I hope that the book has broad appeal, um, as it were, not so much from the point of view of being a book about science, but a point about being about a man who just has this incredible um, life. Hmm. I think it's but an American love story. Right, we, well, and that's that's a very nice way of putting it. But it's you're being a little disingenuous, if I may, if I may say so, right. because clearly you have set him against the backdrop of a very that's elaborate yeah. um, uh, mirror world of science. They have organizations, they have peer-reviewed sort yeah. of publications, they have. Yeah. I I I just wrote down from from the book that this one group that you were looking at. Mm. The Natural Philosophy Alliance uh, mm. has uh, on its listing, on its, on yes. its uh, membership roster, yes. uh, uh, almost 2,000 you know, officially dissident uh, yes. scientists, uh, yes. list 1,300 books, uh, mm. not by people like you, but by people like Jim. It has mm. a, a, a listing, a catalog of 1,000 websites devoted to mm. alternative explanations for, and abstracts, and this was the part that mm. really got me, abstracts of 5,000 papers. You know. mm. So this is not just simply an interesting tale of a quirky mm. person. You are staging a broader critique of something, it seems to me, and yeah. you put this against the, the, the kind of interesting mm. and perhaps spurious cosmology of string theory at the mm. end. It's a, mm. So you're, not, you're up to more than this. You know, you're, not <laughs> fooling, you're not fooling well, us. You're up to more. I do. I mean, there's... I would like to think that a broad cross-section of people might be interested in this story of incredible human ingenuity and creativity in an individual life. But you're right, Lee. I mean, what, I, what I'm really interested in, what all my books are about, is really the sociological context of science. And I would really like to get discussion, a broad discussion among people interested in science about the sociological issues here. And the w one way I think of it to myself is that I think we've had one revolution in science communication and we need another one. The first revolution we've had in science communication was um, really ha began to happen in the mid 70s when they start, I mean, many all you students are probably too young to remember this, but when I finished university um, in 1981, there was very little um, popular science communication out there. And particularly, there wasn't much written by actual scientists. And then people like, um, in England, Paul Davies started to write books. And in America, there was the Dancing Wu Lee Masters and the Tao of Physics. And these books actually revolutionized the popular understanding of physics. And suddenly, physics went from being something associated with weaponry, but to be something associated with mysticism. And it revolutionized the public perception of physics. And there's been, and, and then Stephen Hawking came out with his book, and it, and it was a best bestseller in anybody's The Brief History of a Time. Brief History yeah. of Time. Uh -huh. And so we've seen, in the last 25 years, there's been this huge revolution in popular science communication. If you want to read about any area of science, there's lots of good books out there. But what I think we need is, so the, to explain the science, what I think we need is second revolution in science communication, which is talking about the cultural, social, political consequences and landscape in which science happens. And that's what I see myself as doing. So you actually, I think, are have deep sympathies to this character because, in fact, I think you fancy yourself as somewhat of, a, of an outsider from the mainstream of science writing. You've devoted some yeah. time to thinking of other ways of involving people in, in what is, in the end, a narrative. Um, and uh, you founded the Institute for Figuring, in part, to uh, mm. serve as a vehicle uh, for this. You, it's, it's a kind of yeah. science writing as performance art, as, yeah. as home craft. I mean, we're gonna bring us into this a little bit, explain to us a little bit about this project and, yeah. and what happened, if we can digress for a moment. Sure. Um, I started this little, organization called the Institute for Figuring in 2003. Um, and the reason I started it was precisely what you're saying, Lee, is I felt frustrated with the normative channels of science communication. I was having trouble getting editors to let me write about some 
subjects that I was coming across in physics and maths and engineering that I just thought were absolutely amazing, like hyperbolic crochet. And, um, and I thought that these things were absolutely fascinating. There'd be a lot of other people who'd find them fascinating. And I was having trouble convincing editors to let me write about them. And so I actually thought, you know, what I want, what I need to do is to have some kind of framework for doing science communication in a new, in new and more creative ways. And for a while, about a year, I thought, I'll have to convince a university to let me do this with them. I'll have to somehow go under the umbrella of a university. And I was living in LA. And so I thought, I'll have to somehow convince UCLA or USC to let me do a program under them. And one day, and I didn't know how I was going to achieve that. And one day, I woke up as if I'd had a dream. And the, word, the phrase went through my head, I can have an institute too. <laughs> Which is what Jim it's like, Carter It's said like a Paul me. Simon song, isn't there? Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. The, the, he, yes, in, it's um, Diamonds on the Shoulders of Her Shoes. Right, yeah. As I wake up, we'll call it an institute. Mm -hmm. and, but I got this from Jim, because Jim has an institute. It's called the Absolute Motion Institute. The Absolute the Motion Absolute, Institute. Now, it has a research population of one, a degree of tally of zero, of and no students. But nevertheless, right. Jim has an institute. And it publishes these books. Absolute Motion Press is the publisher of his books. And so one day I just woke up with this thought, well, in the age of the, la of the internet, and anyone can have a website, and anyone with a laser printer can have a letterhead and a logo, and increasingly everybody does. What is there to an institute but a letterhead and a logo and what you do? And I thought, I've got a laser printer. I can have a letterhead and a logo, and I'll just start doing things. So I did. So you and reconstituted yourself as an institute. And mm. what did you do? <laughs> well, what, what we do is, um, I said we... I, well, you I had a story you wanted to tell it, that you were not able to get out in a conventional way. It, and yes. you founded this institute. Yes. You weren't just satisfied with having a letterhead, or maybe you were. <laughs> no, no, well, I, want, I wanted to... I wanted to have a, a framework for doing, for communicating to the public about science and mathematics in, in more appealing ways. Because um, it, it was my observation that a lot of my friends who are in this, most of my friends are in the sciences and the arts, wanted to, communi wanted to um, intersect with science, but they didn't read science magazines, which they found a bit dull. And they really wanted to understand science, and they, but they wanted, to, they wanted to be able to be brought into science in ways that they found appealing and exciting. And I thought, I, I really believe that we can do this. And so I started by putting on a few events with scientists and mathematicians. And I would work very, um, when I should say we, we is me and my twin sister Christine, who's a professor at the California Institute of the Arts. We, it was sort of a vision we had together. And, um, she has a full time job teaching in the arts. And so she brought to get to the equation a real understanding of arts, and I brought to the equation the understanding of science. And what we wanted to do was to sort of focus on the aesthetic and poetic enrichments in science itself. So what we initially what we did was we put on lectures with people like mathematicians talking about things like knot theory and intense integrity structures. Um, and I would work with them to craft an evening that was going to be beautiful. They would have a lovely PowerPoint. And I'd work with them to try to make the ideas accessible. And we'd also always have an activity that people would do. And so we put quite a lot of time and energy into working out things that the audience could do so that they weren't just listening to an expert. They were listening to an expert, but then they would have to do something within the course of the evening. So they were like really learning, as it were, by literally playing with ideas. And the way that Chrissy and I think about the Institute for Figuring is that it's a play tank. Like a play in our, tank. In our society, we have these things called think tanks, where people with big minds come and think big thoughts and write books and write articles and opinion pieces. And we think that there needs to be places where people can come and play with ideas. So that's what we wanted to do, is to get people to play with ideas. And the biggest project that we've done was with, we created this thing called the hyperbolic crochet coral reef, which is literally crocheting a coral reef. And I can show you some pictures if you'd like. Um, that is about 
it's hyper corals, all those frilly crenellated structures that they make are actually biological manifestations of a kind of geometry called hyperbolic geometry. And nature has invented these structures many times over, particularly in the ocean, for good biological reasons. Um, and it turns out that for humans, the best way to make these structures is with crochet. Yeah, it's sure, about sure, the sure. only yeah. way. Yeah. But this was a structure that, if, if I remember my history, for, it was for quite some time considered one of those things you couldn't actually, one of those topological conundrums. You couldn't actually show it. You could conceive it. Yes. But you couldn't make it. Well, um, hy hyperbolic space, uh, hyperbolic geometry, hyperbolic space, is a kind of geometry that was discovered by mathematicians in the, in the 19th century as an alternative to Euclidean geometry and spherical geometry that we all know so well. And it was, oh no, am I gonna be able to get this? Can you find us? I can, oh, I can do this. Because of the, your <laughs> genius guy might be able to help with this issue. I can't, I need to go down on the screen to access the PowerPoint. Yeah, do you, do you know how to do that, Dan, while I'm in this? Can you go here? Well, anyway. Um, while we, uh, uh, can you? Uh, there was a question floating Mark, can around. Do you, you have a question, sir? You have the microphone. Yeah. Can, can the I ask? PowerPoint uh, yes, please. While they do there. this, ask a question. Well, I just want to ask her, her to confirm that uh, it's, not, it's right to think that she appreci appreciates the beauty in uh, these constructions. And uh, as physicists and mathematicians oft exactly often down. have said, beauty and truth are somewhat interchangeable. And if a theory is not beautiful, it probably isn't true. Is that, is that right, that you are fascinated by the beauty as well as, or aside from the truth or independently of the truth of his, his theory? Is yes. I mean, I, I am completely fascinated with the beauty of Jim's theory. You know, it was Paul Dirac who said truth is beauty and beauty is truth, and whether that's true or not is a debatable point. But I am deeply fascinated by the beauty of science. I'm, that was why I went to study physics at university, because I thought it was a beautiful way of seeing the world. I don't know how much I ever cared about its capital T truth value. I just thought, I, I thought what it was was sort of pure, pure beauty. Um, and so, yes, I have an inordinate love of beauty. Um, and I like to look at beautiful things and experience beautiful ideas. Um, but that said, you know, Jim, Jim is more than producing beautiful work because there are lots of pretty things out there in the world and I wouldn't spend 15 years of my life writing a book about most of them. Um, I think he, he does represent interesting sociological forces in our society. But you never cared about the truth it was pretty, I mean, I'm trained in, I have a degree in physics. I know what it's like to have, you know, been taught the canonical way. So it was very clear to me the minute I opened Jim's book that from a point of view of, you know, the being empirically verifiable, there are big problems with his theory. So I, you know, I, I was, as it were, unconcerned thank with, thank you very much. I was unconcerned with that question from the beginning because from the point of view of someone trained in physics, it was evident on day one to me that Jim's theory didn't stand up in that sense. Could we possibly turn the lights down? Oh, is that the... We'll just show, I'll just show no, you. No, yeah. Uh, can, uh, will these come is off? Is it possible that these ones can come off? So, you know, I never struggled with that question. It was never mm -hmm. a struggle mm -hmm. for me personally. So, so here, just to thank you, to, but to know we had this working, um, a uh, interesting story idea, this uh, uh, unusual and, and, and interesting <coughs> facet of mathematics and geometry that mm. you can't imagine in a, a, a magazine or a newspaper editor in America, I don't know about the UK, but yeah. um, that would see this as a, as a uh, act of journalism, yet it's something yeah. quite marvelous and interesting about science. And you chose this as a way to tell it. Explain to us what we're looking at. Yeah. Well, what this is, it's a 
It's an invocation of a coral reef made in crochet. And the reason that one is doing it in crochet is because all these frilly crenellated structures that you see, which are so emblematic of coral reefs, are, as I said, biological manifests. See all the frilly crenellated? That, that's actually hyperbolic structures. And, and in coral reefs, many, many coral reef organisms have these hyperbolic structures because it's a way to maximise surface area and therefore maximise the intake of nutrients. So in the marine world, hyperbolic creatures have been, as it were, invented by nature over and over again since really almost the Cambrian era. So this is a very, very old and ancient form in nature. But it turns out that hyperbolic geometry was considered in Western mathematics in an aberration because it goes against Euclid's parallel postulate, which is the most famous postulate in mathematics. And in fact, mathematicians spent hundreds of years trying to prove like, that anything like this was impossible until in the ni early 19th century, um, mathematicians, three mathematicians independently discovered it, one of whom was Gauss, the greatest, some people believe, the greatest mathematician since Euclid. And they were horrified because it seemed like an impossible structure. And, but it turns out that even though mathematicians discovered it in the 19th century, they, they could, as it were, they could understand it formulaically, but they didn't know what it looked like. They, they hmm. didn't recognize that it was happening in nature all around them. And I once asked the mathematicians who, who do a lot of this work now, why didn't mathematicians realize these things were happening all around them? And, and, and they said to me, well, I guess there wasn't all that many mathematicians sitting around looking at sea slugs which is probably true, but there were a lot of mathematicians sitting around looking at lettuce, and lettuce is a mm -hmm. hyperbolic structure. Lettuce, vegetable, so yeah. Okay. all those frilly crenellated vegetables, they're hyperbolic structures. So why weren't mathematicians recognizing this structure literally in their lunch? Now, that actually <laughs> raises very deep questions. To answer that question, we could have a whole discussion about that. It raises very deep questions about the philosophy of mathematics and what mathematicians of the 19th century thought mathematics could do and what they thought it couldn't do. And it's a very interesting story about the conception of what mathematics was. And things like the discovery of things like hyperbolic geometry actually brought into being a revolution in mathematics. But what Chrissy and I, it turns out the best way for humans to make these structures is with crochet. With crochet. Which was a discovery made by a Cornell University mm. mathematician, Dr. Diana Taimina, only as recently as 1997. And she came along and said, you know, because a lot of mathematicians thought you couldn't have models of this. And she came along and said, you know what, guys, I can do it with crochet. And, and I'll sh I bought a couple to show you, because Lee had asked you me just to. happen to have one in your bag, yes. I just happen to have a few in my bag. <laughs> so you can. <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's fascinating about this, I think Nothing that like in terms of our discussion, uh, yeah. is that if I had been happy mm. enough to have this idea, mm. I would be making the rounds of popular science or Scientific American or wherever, mm. you know, pitching the, oh, the, the mathematics in your lunchbox uh, yeah. as a little story. Yeah. But you, you chose a whole different way, a whole different path. I mean, here it is. This <laughs> is a beautiful, uh, but, but of course, so really there's several things going on here. Um, yes. One of them is storytelling. One of them yeah. is what, you're, this is science writing as a participatory democracy or a Absolutely. feminist collective? Uh, what, uh, explain this. Well, what, here by the way, this is um, Sorry, I had a it demonstration. Sorry, uh, This is a demonstration mm -hmm. stitched in wool on a, that the most famous postulate in mathematics, Euclid's parallel postulate, is wrong. And it's the first time mathematicians could literally hold a model of this in their hands and see it. So it's, it's really remarkable that, that yeah. one could do this with a handicraft. So we, <laughs> we... Could we, could we possibly have a definition of hyperbolic structure? What, what is that? Well, yes, we could. Um, shall I digress? Digress. Um, OK, I just have to go into see where in the PowerPoint. Um, as you can see, I give entire talks about this. Oh, sure. But sure. Um, just, uh, just let me show you this while we're on our way. See, that these are hyperbolic. I mean, sorry, these are crocheted ones. 
and come on. Oh. Look, there's real ones. <laughs> it's really true. See, nature's been doing it since the Silurian age, and as well as corals and sponges, sea slugs do this. So I, when I give my talk about this, I sometimes say the goal of my talk is to get us all up to the level of a sea slug. <laughs> that would be a giant step forward. Um, geez, I Ah, okay, I didn't know it was in circulation again. Good, oh, here good, good. Sorry. Okay, here. thank you. You're next. Okay. This, if we so we're going to digress briefly into non-Euclidean space, and hopefully we will emerge intact. Thank you. Should we do it now? Or do well, we if it's yeah. a short answer. Yeah. I mean, yeah. There are several ways that you can understand hyperbolic geometry, but the easiest way to understand it is in terms of what's called tiling the plane or tessellating the plane. So you all know about two kinds of geometry, flat or Euclidean geometry and spherical geometry, you know, the surface of the earth. So how do we, mathematicians like to have you know, concrete, well-defined um, definitions of things? So here's a definition of, of the Euclidean plane. Basically, you can put a bunch of hexagons together and they all fit together perfectly. I mean, you, you all know a version of this in nature. What is it? Beads, sorry? Honeycomb, yeah. In some sense, that's a definition of, high, of, of the plane, that hexagons fit together. On the surface of a sphere, we don't have, it's not tiled all with hexagons. It's tiled, you take out some of the hexagons and you put a five-sided figure of pentagon in the middle. This is the structure of a soccer ball and it's the structure of a geodesic dome. So if you can do this, it, can you see that there should be an opposite of this? So <coughs> does anyone want to say what it would be? So you say that loudly? Did everyone hear that? No. Instead just of repeat. putting... I just, no, just repeat for her so they can hear. What yeah, did she say? Yeah, what she, yes, what she oh. said was that we would ta instead of putting five, taking out some of the six-sided hexagons and replacing them with... He, uh, with um, pentagons, which have five sides, you do the opposite. You replace them with heptagons, which have seven sides. So here you're literally taking away some space and it pulls the flat plane in on itself and makes a closed sphere. If you do the opposite move, you put seven-sided ones, you open out the space and you get these kind of lettuce-like <coughs> hyperbolic structures. So the tessellation of your surface is actually one way you could geometrically tell what surface you lived on. And this is actually relevant to cosmology because um, the discovery of hyperbolic space ushered in the whole field of non-Euclidean geometry, which is ultimately the geometry that underlies general relativity and which will tell us about the structure of our universe. And it is through these kind of geometric explorations of, of actually how does as it were, the surf surface of our space-time, which is four-dimensional, mm -hmm. not two. How does it behave? These kinds of properties are actually fundamental to understand. And this is what you can embody but in the crochet. It t yes. It turns out, so if you do mathematically perfect ones, you, you get these very kind of l beautiful, but very r rather um, geometric-looking things. The innovation that we had with our project was what if I deviate from the mathematical perfection? What if I don't do an exactly mathematically perfect one, but I, and it was my sister's deviation from the pure mathematics that brought this into being. After we'd been doing the mathematically pure ones for a while, she came, she came home one day and said, I'm sick of doing the mathematically perfect ones. I want to branch out and be a bit you know, wonky. And I'm the scientist, she's the artist. And I said, oh, but we have to stick to the formula. And Christine said, you know, I'm sick of the formula. We've done everything we can do with the formula. I'm going to branch out. So she came home with this bag of fluffy pink and sparkly yarns and started crocheting wonky. And as soon as she did, we started to get um, ones that were more natural looking. As soon mm. as you, got, you deviated from pure mathematics, what you got was instead of these incredibly geometric looking ones, you got ones that were very organic. Hmm. 
And that's exactly why these things look natural, because in nature, nature is not sticking mm -hmm. to perfection. You know, right, but you use this as a, as a way to bring people into this. Yes, well, what we thought is that we started, do, then we conceived the idea, well, it looks like a coral reef because this is what corals are doing. We could crochet a coral reef and it could be a collective project. And we really thought that maybe 10 or 20 people would want to join us in this unique sort of weirdo fusion of maths and handicrafts and marine biology because a big reason we wanted to do this project was to try to find ways to bring attention to the dreadful plight the coral reefs have been devastated all over the world due to global warming and ocean acidification. It was conceived of as a project in ecological awareness. And so we, we thought this was a wonderful way to communicate both about mathematics and about two of the biggest environmental problems on our planet, and particularly to communicate to women. And six years later, it's become, as far as I know, the biggest art science project in the world, and it's all been done from our living room with not a single dollar of support from any science foundation. And how many people roughly have been involved in creating these? Uh, about, uh, we know that in, in the exhibitions that we've had around the world that at least 5,000 women have contributed models. So 5,000 women least, have? Yeah, and, and three, because the show was at this Smithsonian for six months, more than three million people have seen the show. Yeah. And I think it's really served as a very powerful way to engage a huge number of women, both with the mathematics and with the marine um, biology and environmental issues. So it's, it's a hugely powerful form of, of, of science education. And science communication. And science communication. Uh, no, this fellow's been very, very, pa okay, oh. Yeah. Susan was first and yeah. Thank you. You've been very patient. Sorry, no, thank you. Yeah. Sorry, I, I don't really thank know you. if this question is that relevant now. It's kind of, we're kind of backtracking a bit, but before um, you spoke about how uh, we define science and how the definition is not as rigid as we would like it to be, mm. and um, as a tangent to that, you, the way that you describe Jim seems to mm. me that while you may not believe his theory is being quote unquote true you believe in him as an alternative way of thinking. How do you personally define science? And did mm -hmm. he, in his capacity as a guru, for want of a better word, change your definition of science? He, he didn't make me think differently about what science is so much, I think, as, well, maybe you're right about that. Um, mainly, or the way I've thought about it to myself, is that I think he, he radically, trying to understand Jim, radically changed my conception of what is the function of science. It made me think much more deeply about what is the role of science in our lives. And it, it, it caused me to think a lot more about this role of science as being the way that we, as it were, locate ourselves in a wider cosmological realm, and what what do we think, as it were? I mean, I suppose it is what science is in a way, because it's it's the what stories do science tell us, and how do those stories impact upon us, and how do we, as a society, assess which ones of these stories we're going to accept? So. I think about, it, but I mean, in a way, you're right. It did force me to think about what science is, because part of what science is is is, is the functions that it serves. And it ma it made me did make me come to the conclusion that we were often being given a, a too hard and fast and simplistic conception of what science is. Uh, my question was actually just quickly. No. Right here. Yeah. <laughs> um, what did Jim think of the book? What did Jim did, think of yeah. the book? Yes, a very good question. <laughs> yes, that's a very good question. You know, I delayed showing it to him for a long time because I was worried about that. And when um, he saw, I, I did show him a draft of it before it was completed, and it and he came down from Washington to spend a weekend with me because he wanted to talk about it. And of course I, you know, welcomed him doing that, although I was a bit apprehensive about this meeting. 
and it, 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 it was very clear that it was confronting to him because he must have thought, probably thought, that because I'd spent so much time with him that I, as it were, thought his theory was true in, in the sense that we've been talking about. And he realised reading it that I didn't. And I think in some sense that was it was very difficult for him. He has an incredibly grounded, sane, wonderful wife and she completely understood the point of what I was doing. And there was this conversation on my front lawn with me and Jim and Linda. Where I think Jim was actually rather upset and Linda was saying, you know, as it were, very calming things. And it was really wonderful because Jim thought about it and by the end of the evening, he was totally fine. And I think he's rare in that sense. So looking at this then for a moment um, as a source, just to follow up on, on that's a kind of a, a, an essential mm. moment in any profile or any, any mm. extended um, uh, writing exercise. Um, it's the thing that Janet Malcolm likes to uh, mm. task us all with, that mm. we're uh, duplicious snakes and uh, betrayers of those we entice into trusting us. Yes. Um, Joan Didion says a similar thing too. Yes, well, mm. did you betray him? What were the terms of engagement? I, um, no, I, you know, I thought long and hard about that question be, because Joan Didion has an essay in Slouching Towards Bethlehem where she says that, that, we're all, that all of us as journalists betray our subjects. And I remember when I read this, it was halfway through my book, and I thought, oh my gosh, is that what I'm doing? Am I betraying this man who I've come to love and who trusts me? Are we all betrayers? And I, you know, I don't actually believe that's true. I, I don't think it, I don't, and I think journalists can and do betray people, but I don't think it's, a, it's, it's the way it always is or has to be. Um, so, no, I don't think that I betrayed Jim at all. Um, I think I wrote a book to make the world fall in love with him. And I believe that he comes across as a supremely lovable person. Sort of, you know, in some ways very eccentric and bizarre and cranky, but also lovable. I think I've done Jim a huge service because I've brought his theory to the attention of the world, which is what he wants. That said, there is an issue here. What will happen to him when the spotlight has, is shined on him and, he, and there is the possibility for him to actually get feedback <coughs> from people who are less loving than me? What, and I do worry about that. You know, he's always wanted the attention of the scientific world. Now he's got it. Will he be able to withstand that? That I worry about. You had a question, yes. In respect to your lovely illustrations, I know that um, there's been a, a good deal of work helping math teachers use this crochet mm. technique as a way of helping students understand the curves, etc. But I haven't yet heard of a really good explanation about the reason why you can mimic coral reefs this way is that the crocheting technique mm. of one stitch and then you, you enlarge it to the next row and you enlarge it to two the next row is exactly the way biological cells grow and divide. And so that every, all these images are just reflections of and when a coral reef wants to have <coughs> maximum exposure and all the invertebrates, the jellyfishes and the whatnot, uh, their, their skins are built this way mm. because of the way cells, if you want to do any imagery, if you are a couple of cells and you want to grow, each one will divide by two and then you can divide mm. differently and you will get, mm. which is exactly what you do in crocheting. But it's puzzled me because I'm a little familiar with some of this and I haven't heard that correlation made between the math and the biology. Um, we, 
we do spend a little bit of time talking about that. The, the main reason that you get these hyperbolic structures in nature is, is because of this issue of nutrient collection. That so if, you're, if, if you're a critter living in the sea and you can't go, and you're particularly a sessile creature attached to the floor, you, see, you can't go chasing after your lunch you have to let you, you have to your lunch comes to you through the thin soup of the ocean so you want to collect the maximum through your skin so you want to have the maximum surface yeah. area and i was making the and point that, that you get the structures because of the way cells divide and grow right yeah. yes yes yeah. but but the but a question is why don't all of us do this i mean why don't we have hyperbolic limbs we have cells that well, the invertebrate world is full of wonderful things that look yes. like that. <laughs> and in fact, you know, th there are many places, in, you know, like in, in our intestines, there are hyperbolic structures to um, filter food, and there are hyperbolic structures on the surfaces of a lot of cells. So hyperbolic structures actually come up a lot at the cellular and molecular biological level. But I, I think it does... It, it certainly can excite the stu it's yes. very good for teaching, excites the student into, yes. okay, well, how did those cells grow? And I can yes. take some stitches and a needle and yes. guess what? Yes, and yeah. I, yeah, no, it's mm -hmm. true. So as a, as a practical matter, how do you write? Where do you write? Do you write in a barrel? you have a basement room? Oh. Do you use a fountain pen? Do you have a... <laughs> Uh, do you dictate uh, as you pace? What That's do you do? Um, I have a home office, Lee, and I, um, I, I'm one of those people who I obsessively write <coughs> masses of notes to myself in this handwritten spidery scrawl that even I have trouble reading a lot of the time. I, so w when I'm working on something, I tend to fill masses of notepads with notes and I put, when, when I'm working on a book, I have to have a map at any time of what I think the, the geography of the book is at any particular point in time. So I keep fo folders of, you know, I think there'll be a chapter on this and then a chapter on that and a chapter and I put more of my notes into the folders and I've come to understand now that I, that I have to accept that that's a fluid process, that at any point in time, the set of folders which represents the set of possible chapters, that will change radically before the end of the book. So I have many piles of, you know, this was 2006 set of chapters and this was 2007 set of chapters. And, um, so. and how often do you rewrite? A lot. Well, it's, well, it's a lot. <laughs> oh, you know, um, I'm almost ashamed to say, <laughs> a lot, Lee. <laughs> I, I no, do you, mean a, do you mean a lot or do you mean a lot? I mean, well, so 10 I, to the 500? This, uh, book, this book went through three radical, radically different drafts. So we, there, there were whole versions of it that were like, there, there are whole chapters that just have disappeared. I don't even know where they've gone anymore. Um, what makes you throw away a chapter? It's no good. <laughs> well, no, actually, that's not true. I threw away one chapter, which I did. I can't find it anymore, and I'm really, um, I'm trying to find it because it would make a lovely article. But um, you mean you misplaced it in the? Uh, when you say you can't find it? Well, I just can't find. Uh, it must be in my files somewhere, ah, but okay. I've got so All many right. files I can't find it. Yeah. Oliver Sacks has a lovely thing. He calls himself an annihilation field. He once disappeared a whole book. I've never gone that far, but I have disappeared a few chapters. Um, and so what, what makes a chapter disappear? Well, part of it was, I mean, with this book, I, I was ruthless about the thing that I have to, I have to, I really want to write a book that's accessible, that's accessible that I want to stay true to the philosophy in some sense of what this book is about, which is accessibility. And so I, I did throw away chapters that I thought got too esoteric. I rewrote, one of the big reasons I rewrote the book radically 
was because I thought it was, you know, it was too esoteric and academic and I wanted it to be an accessible journey. Some of the chapters, I don't know, I've probably rewritten them seven or eight times. Um, I, I am an obsessive rewriter. I'll fiddle till the cows come home. And, and, and as, as long as my editor will let me <laughs> send in another revision, I will. Um, I think I tested everybody's patience at my publisher on that score. I'm going to get your question, but I just need to, to, to nail this down. So this was a, a kind of a project that obsessed you or interested you for 15 years, but you weren't writing a book for 15 years. Mm -hmm. how, how long a slice of that was, was, the, was you, were you engaged actually in book writing? I got then, the contract to write the book in the very beginning of 2005. Okay. So it's been a six year process. Right. Now I obviously haven't been at that full time. Because you had to eat. Because I had to eat. Yeah. And, I was g and I had this coral reef thingy that took over my life too. So I was kind of mm -hmm. veering between these two projects. Mm -hmm. One which was sort of, as it were, mad obsessive guys mm -hmm. and one which sort of engaged right. mad obsessive guys. And your women. editor here did not think it was going to be a six year project. I don't think that Jackie. <laughs> 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 planning on For the record. They, they never <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you're smiling though. <laughs> Can, can we, yeah, pass her the microphone? I, I promise you we'll get, we'll, we'll get back. This yeah, is, sorry. no, no, if, if you don't mind, this would be very interesting, yeah. Were you reading this as, as a person who, you know, was interested or familiar with, with modern physics or? or uh, familiar with modern physics, yes, but not, um, I'm certainly not a professional at it. I, I edit a lot of science books along with other topics, but, um, one of the things that interests me about some of the questions that have come up is that they mirror some of the questions that came up in our editorial process. Hmm. Um, so that at one point, very early on, and Margaret had mentioned that some of her chapters were too esoteric, there was the issue of how much will you ask the reader to try to understand of this. And one of the things that came up with that is that it would be one thing to have to work very, very hard to sort of recreate for yourself um, Jim's explanations of all this if at the end of it you were going to find out it was all right, it was all true. But if the notion of the book is not to, to make a judgment that he is correct with this, then you have to sort of adjust how much you're asking people to, how, how deeply are you asking people to go into his world in terms of the te technical aspects of it. And I think that one of, one of uh, the revisions then broadened it out a lot more into his life and understanding sort of the meaning of what he was doing um, rather than, you know, trying to explain exactly what he means by uh, gravity not existing as we know it. I mean, it's, it's certainly an interesting concept, but you know, you only want to spend 30 pages on that if, in fact, you're going to find out, well, he's right. But if you're not going to find that out, you, you probably would feel like maybe you're asking too much of me that I'm going to read 30 pages on that. Mm -hmm. what, for a project like this, um, what, what delimits your patience <laughs> as an editor? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would say as long as you keep believing. I mean, and I kept believing because it was all there and Margaret brought it. I mean, every time, and she would come into New York and we would talk, um, and so I always believed in what she was trying to do. I mean, I didn't always see it there on the page yet, and she was always willing to keep working until she got it. And uh, let me say something about this process too, because um, this, this is my third full-length book, and, and this was by far the deepest engagement that I'd had with an editor who was willing to work with me 
on the big picture. The, Jackie really helped to, hugely to define what became the ultimate structure of the book. She was the one that made this fabulous suggestion of why don't we have Jim, as it were, Jim's life story is kind of a book within the book. So the sort of the structure of the book is, is mm. three parts. It's sort of a setup. Then there's Jim's life, and then there's a kind of what does this all mean? And it was Jackie who had that structural ah. conception because I was sort of doing a chapter of meaning, a chapter of life, chapter, and Works and beautiful. and it shows you, you know, <laughs> from glad. Th what a good editor can bring to a writer. It's and I think. It's an experience that those of us who have it are very privileged to have because it's not, editors don't always have the time to work this deeply with writers and I was very, very lucky that, that Jackie was there and, and that Walker supported the book mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to the extent of letting her spend this okay, money. Okay, now I want to ask Jackie a question. Is that all right? Yes. Because <laughs> we're not, you're just, it's just a nice uh, uh, thing that you're here. We, we didn't know that you were going to be here. So. Most editors now haven't got the time um, to really dig into a story, to really hold a writer's hand, to really, you know, think through the story. If you were responsible for coming up with that structure, you clearly gave it a lot of thought. So how come you have so much time? How come you're doing this? And it's not, it's not normal. Dan, you have an editor. Is this normal? No. Uh, actually, my, my current editor. I've had ah, your hard. current editor. Okay. Well, that's a different story. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, well that's great, but, but is this, is this uh, are you normal? I don't think so. <laughs> well, probably a lot of people don't think so, but... Um, well, I meant that in a nice No, way. I didn't. Um, well, Walker initially was an independent publisher for about a little over 40 years, and we were acquired by Bloomsbury maybe about five years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, George Gibson is the publisher well, he was a publisher for Walker when we were independent, and he continues to be the um, editorial director of Bloomsbury U.S. And uh, we, we kept a very, very small list, very contained, um, you know, not trying to publish a lot of books, but trying to, to do as many as we were going to do and give them the time and the effort that we felt they deserved. And, um, and we were able to do that for, for quite a long time. It's changed a little bit because we're now part of a larger corporation, um, but that's also brought a lot of advantages because um, we have much wider distribution of our books, um, more resources to use to promote books. Um, so, you know, it's a balancing act. Um, and I think that uh, I've, I felt I've been around for, for the best of both sides of it. When, we were a much smaller company, and now we were part of a larger one. Hmm. Well, thank you, thank you. I'm going to ask you to give that back to this person who was nice enough to let us talk to you for a moment. But I appreciate that very much. Um, this is, I guess, also a question. Yeah, good, good, good. Is it off? Okay, I got it. <laughs> um, you said that you're an obsessive rewriter and I, I totally understand that and I'm wondering when do you know when you're done when you have this that affliction like how do you sorry I'm when do you know I'm you're hearing. you're finished we're re rewriting how do you know when to stop how yeah. do you know when to stop oh I mean you must have your own sense and then if you're working with an editor they they also tell you but or did she when just is stop, it done? Did your editor just stop you and say she, forget it but then no this is the key question yes well to a certain degree, it's a really good question because writers can be, and I'm in danger of this, of, of um, not knowing when to stop and keep going and sometimes you can you know, crush the things that you've created by you know, overdoing it. In this case, it, it was quite, it was simpler than that, that basically I committed at some point <laughs> Even I, at some point, committed to an actual deadline for this book, years after that I was contractually obliged to, um, and 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 it was then it was on the schedule, and it had to fit. It had to, <laughs> which was actually good for me because um, I think I probably would have found it difficult to know when to stop. 
and, and I think that it is a very hard problem. Sometimes I think that that is actually, you know, really great writers must have that sense of, you know, just doing it to a certain point and then moving on to something else. I think that's one of the reasons why writers never, writers tend never to read themselves in published form or mm. actors never watch the finished movie because mm. the idea of something being finished, there's something very painful about that. I, I say this as a, as a person who's on his fifth year of a project. It, it's, yeah. if, if you, it's, it's very hard to stop. It, it really is very hard to stop because you can always make something better. Yeah. And the other thing, I mean, th it's a really good question to ask because I'll, I'll tell you, uh, I'm, I'm not good at knowing when to stop, but one thing I am actually good at, and I think this is something that as, a, as professional writers we all have to learn to do, is know <coughs> I'm actually extremely good at wielding the red pen and knowing you know, getting stuff out. I'm, I'm absolutely unafraid to say, I spent a lot of time on that, nevertheless, out. And, and I think that is something that it's like, you have to be willing to say, it's not in the service of the book to have this long ramble about this thing, even though I spent gosh knows how long researching and writing that bit. It's just, it doesn't belong here, out it goes. And one of the things, that when I wrote this book, I mean, I, if the book's about 82,000 words, I probably wrote at least 130,000 words all up, hmm. more, probably more than that in various drafts. And, and, and just, I had a commitment that this book had to be accessible, and one of the things that that means is it has to be sh not too long. One of the greatest selling science books of all time is Dana, Dava Sobel's book, um, Longitude, which Walker also published. Mm -hmm. And I once wrote a little review about Longitude where I said one of the th reasons this book is so successful and so great is because of its shortitude. It's only huh. 40,000 words. Yeah. And I cannot tell you how much I think that lesson matters. Brian Greene's latest book is 150,000 words. S there's this tendency now with science books to make them longer and longer because we spend so much time invested in the research and we, you know, it takes years to understand the subject. You do all this grand work and you want to put in everything. But people don't have time and they don't have the mental energy. It's really important, I think, to be able to wield the red pen on yourself and be fearless about that. It's, it's good for you and it's good for the book, most cases. <laughs> I don't know what you feel about that, Robert. Oh, no, yeah, I mean, yeah. if, if there's a, a sentence that you love or an analogy that just makes your toes curl, it's a sign you should kill it. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's really perverse, but yeah. I th that's true, I think. Mm. I think many writers feel that way. Yeah, and it's hard. It's, it's hard, but it's a good skill to develop. We had a question here. Yes. Thanks. Margaret, I want to um, ask you about the other motivation that you mentioned at the beginning about why you wanted to write this book, which was about the sociology or the sociological um, kind of conditions or motivation for a person to take on this task, uh, particularly in a time which seems to be just filled with science deniers. I'm interested in your observation about that. That's a very, very, very good question, Pat. Um, and this is this is the thing. In many ways, this is this issue that Pat's raising is the thing that's been the most difficult for me to struggle with, that we do live in an age at the moment where there's a lot of anti-science sentiment. And a lot, when I've said to my physicist friends and scientist friends that I was doing this book, a lot of them have immediately responded with, well, you're just encouraging this anti-science sentiment, where's the moral integrity in that? And that's the thing that I've actually been quite afraid of about publishing this book. I mean, really, that's the one thing that really did strike fear into my heart, that I would be accused when the book came out of being anti-science. But I don't believe that I am, because I, I think that what this book is about is, is trying to understand where science does fit in, and if a lot of into our lives and if a lot of people are feeling alienated by the scientific world picture 
they read about in science magazines and books, and I think a lot of people are, it's not surprising that they would turn elsewhere for explanations. And I think my guys love science. They're, they're not turning away from science. They're saying, we believe science can be a, a satisfying description of the world, but we're going to have a, scientific, a science, as it were, that's psychologically acceptable to us. Some people's reaction to feeling alienated by science turn away from it completely, like creationists. And that's why, or, or you know, new age mysticism, which rejects science, you know, goes into all sorts of other directions. And I actually think that one of the reasons why this is all going on is because people do actually feel deeply, a lot of people feel deeply alienated by the science they read about. And they don't understand it. And it just seems like that's for this sort of elite other group of people, it's not for me. And I think that's a really serious sociological problem that those of us who love science need to talk about. And so, uh, but, but that, is, that is the one issue that, you know, somebody actually on the radio the other day effectively said that to me the other day. You know, aren't you just sort of feeding into this anti-science thing? I think that Would you like you've to given me? us a wonderful evening and you've given us a great deal of thought and a great deal of consideration and you've shared a lot about your writing and more importantly your thoughts about communicating science and science itself. And um, I would like to wrap it up now. Mm -hmm. um, you were making a move toward your computer like you were gonna show us films of <coughs> Jim smoke shooting rings. smoke rings. Yeah. And if you'd like to do that, I can't think of a nicer way to end. Um, you wanna I would love to show okay. you smoke ring photos. I mean, this is a perfect, you know, visual metaphor for what yes. this guy does. I mean, he's just blown smoke, but it's so pretty. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's true. It's just blown smoke. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not much of a tech. How no? do I, just, what just I want to do is get to the menu. Oh, uh, well, don't you oh, get here the we me go. menu? menu yeah. Sorry, I'm um, being. Well, here yes. Superman. Yeah, here comes here Superman. Comes Superman. <laughs> the, uh, she has a video here somewhere. If, could oh, we, could we get to the, it's not responding. If, okay. that what I need to do is get to the menu so I can go to the right chapter. I thought the Macs were the ones that were just supposed to work, you know, I mean. Oh, no. uh, Not anymore. Yeah, I mean, it's, even the machines are in mourning, you know. <laughs> That's a nice point. Okay. Uh, All right, well. The, so if we go to the chapters, okay, here we go. and then. Okay, and. I was curious about, oh, okay, good, we're here, all right, all right, so, um, here we are in an age of super colliders and billion dollar neutrino physics experiments at the South Pole, here we have real research. Jim believes that this is an alternative, cheap version of particle physics. Well, and at some point, so did Maxwell, right? Mm. Feynman plays with pie plates. Oh. Oh no, it, that that's actually made with a disco fog machine. <laughs> <laughs> that. Ah. garbage can which is cut got a hole cut in the side and a rubber membrane put on the top of it which he fills with smoke from this disco fog machine. It all cost about three dollars fifty. That's gonna be the all-time record there. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> Bart, thank you very, very much. <laughs> Thank you.